आत्मानं रतितं विद्धि शरीरं रतमेव तु बुद्धिं तु सारतिं विद्धि मन प्रग्रहमेव च no the individual self as the master of the chariot and the body as the chariot no the intellect as the charioteer and the mind as verily the bridle shankaracharya's tika of these vidhi no atmanang the self the enjoyer of the fruits of karma which is the soul in the worldly state as ratinang the rider the master of the chariot to and no shariram the body as the ratam the chariot since the body is pulled by the senses which occupy the place of the horses tied to the chariot to and vidhi no buddhim the intellect characterized by determination as saratin charioteer since the body has the guiding intellect as its chief just as the chariot has the guiding charioteer as its chief all physical work being generally directed by the intellect no manaha the mind characterized by volition doubt etc as pragraham bridle for just as the horses act when held in by the reins similarly the senses such as the ear etc act when held in by the mind indriyani hayana hul vishayam steshu gocharan they call the senses the horses the senses having been imagined as horses know the objects as the ways the discriminating people call that self the enjoyer when it is associated with the body senses and mind and the tika ah who who they those versed in calling up the imagery of the chariot call indriyani the senses i ear etc hayan horses because of the similarity of drawing the chariot and the body teshu those very senses having been imagined as horses no vishayan the objects such as color etc as gocharan the roads manishinaha the discriminating people ahu hu call atmendriya manoyuktam the self as associated with the body senses and mind as bhokta the enjoyer the transmigrating soul for the absolute self can have no enjoyership its enjoyership is in fact created by the limiting adjuncts such as the intellect etc thus also there is another vedic text which shows the non enjoyership of the absolute self it thinks as it were and shakes as it were etc brihararanyaka 4 37 only if this is so does it become appropriate to attain the state of vishnu katopanishad 139 as one's own through the analogy of the chariot which is going to be elaborated but not otherwise because one cannot transcend one's true nature namaste So this is the beginning of the simile of the chariot and this image is found in many books in many literatures of the Vedic tradition it's not unique to this Upanishad but what is unique is it's impossible to misinterpret it because <laughs> we have Shankaracharya's tika his commentary his word for word commentary on each verse so basically the picture is you have a chariot and the master of the chariot is riding in the chariot 
and then there's a charioteer who is driving the chariot, which has uh, horses yoked to it, connected to reins and with a bridle or bit in their mouth. So then these various parts are described as follows. The self is the master, the body is the chariot, the intellect is the charioteer, and the mind is the bridle. So the chariot is controlled not directly by the master, but indirectly through the mind. And the mind also indirectly controls the horses by means of the reins and the bridle. So what does this mean? That the intellect is different from the mind. The intellect is purpose, intention, and the mind is will and action. So this division of functions is there in everyone because of the five bodies, the panchakosha. And they are the anamaya kosha is the body, the gross body and the senses. The pranamaya kosha is the vital energy, life energy. The manomaya kosha is the mind. The vijnana maya kosha is the intelligence. And finally, the Ananda Maya Kosha is the self, consciousness. Ananda means bliss. So when one realizes this Ananda Maya, uh, the self, then one feels bliss. <laughs> it's described in the, in the Upanishad earlier and also later that he rejoices is the exact word used. He rejoices, he's, he's partying, man, he's enjoying, wow, finally, the real thing. Huh? This is the magic of self-realization, that it not only brings relief from suffering, it also brings positive joy, ananda, right? So then it goes on in the next verse, the senses are the horses, and the objects of the senses are the ways, the roads, the paths that the chariot travels. So the self is the enjoyer when it's associated with the body, mind, intelligence, and senses. Otherwise, when the self is separate from these, it's not an enjoyer, it's, it's not anything. <laughs> it's completely in, in itself whole. It only becomes an enjoyer when it's yoked, connected with the body. We talked about this before, where the mind and senses have to be connected to the self to function at all. When the self leaves the body at the time of death, the whole thing falls down and then gradually disintegrates. So the presence of the self is what brings the prana, the mana, the mind, the vijnana, the intelligence, and the ananda, the bliss, consciousness, the actual function of enjoyment into the body. Otherwise, these parts just fly apart and disintegrate. Uh, for example, we've been talking about death and how death is the eater of souls, as he's called in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, that when unqualified people come to death, usually being dragged, <laughs> kicking and screaming, because they have no assets of self-realization, they don't understand what's happening. They think that they are the body, and the body is being taken away from them, and they're in acute distress because of ignorance. Death actually consumes them. He destroys them. The subtle bodies are separated, torn apart. And of course, all this causes great suffering to the embodied living entity. So the problem is ignorance, because when that ignorance is removed, when one attains knowledge of the self, death treats him as a guest. See, that's the difference between Pashu, or animalistic human being, 
and an actual human being. The actual human being has knowledge and he follows the rules and regulations in the scriptures and thereby gets mercy from death. In fact, his individual existence is continuous. It, it is not interrupted as in the case of the Pashu, whose individuality has to be destroyed because it's aberrant. It's against the Vedic principles. It's become a disease. So this is death's function, that he cures the living entity of the diseases of a perverted mind, energy, intelligence, and so on, the senses, and everything that has become polluted and contaminated by wrong association, wrong knowledge, wrong action, and so forth. So, you know, he's actually doing that, that living being a favor by removing these contaminated things, but, you know, it's done without anesthetic. <laughs> So to the living entity, it appears that he's being thrown in hell and tortured in different ways. And this is very painful. Uh, in fact, in several Vedic literatures and also in the Buddha's teaching, all these hells are described in detail. But what are the functions of these hells? They are to remove the contamination and, and this is why when people are reborn in this material world, they don't remember the previous life. They don't remember because that identity was destroyed by death. Those subtle bodies were eaten, as it were, disintegrated, destroyed, and exist no more. So the subtle bodies contain the records of the existence in the previous life. So if they're destroyed, then one cannot remember. But a pious living entity, one who follows the Vedic principles by special grace of death, is permitted to remember. When I was a young child, around two, three and a half years old, something like that, I could remember, not very clearly, but I could remember being in this place with these beautiful colored buildings, you know, very nice architecture, like palaces. And all these beautiful living beings, you know, perfect. And just full of knowledge and wisdom and the beautiful music. Oh my God, you know, this was uh, accessible to me in the first years of my life. Now I just have the memory of those memories. <laughs> I can't access them directly anymore. But that's because of accumulating so many impressions from the present life. That will also remain with me when I leave this body and go to the next life. Because there will be a next life. You can bet on it. And the pious person, the intelligent person, prepares for it by becoming purified following the principles of the Vedas. And then when he meets death, like Nachiketa, he's treated as a guest and given boons and given wisdom and a higher position in the next life. That is the path. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>